Greetings, everybody. We are back with the month of September's video commentary and what a month it was. This is a mix of 2022 vibes, seasonal weakness, indecision from the Fed, a false start in inflation, a looming government shutdown, stronger dollar, higher bond yields, just a, just a gross cocktail that all came to a head. So I'm going to share some slides that are of interest to us. We'll go through some of the more nuance. This is, a, this is an odd market environment because performance has been very narrow, meaning much like 2022, there were a few places to hide. In 2023, the broader market is positive, but it's also misleading because once you unpack the drivers of outperformance for the broad U.S. large cap indices, there, there's some gaps there. So I'm going to ex explain that. And we'll go through this and I will share my screen and off we go. So I called this no person's land because as I opened with, this is just many factors converging. We've kind of flatlined over the past couple months when you zoom out. And of course, August and September were down. And what's interesting about this market environment too, is we track the average market movement post World War II. And 2023's version has almost exactly tracked post-World War II average stock market movement. Now, that doesn't mean anything. It's just an interesting thing how this year is playing out almost right in line with post-World War II averages. But once we get down to brass tacks and we start to unpack things, things are, are far from normal. And I think there's still this fallout from the pandemic, unintended consequences, a Fed that's caught in an odd spot. They've done a really good job of threading the needle and potentially navigating a softer landing, but there's no shortage of things to worry about. Many of these interest rate hikes come with a lag effect, meaning if we hike, the uh, consequences of those interest rate hikes might not be obvious for a year or two years down, down the line. So there's all sorts of things going on here. And again, when the market and the Fed are disjointed or not sure of what happens next from a monetary policy standpoint, meaning is the Fed going to pause? Do we have one more hike or two more hikes? Could they cut? There tends to be volatility clusters around those inflection points. So this is a look at September performance. I'm going to start uh, showing this as a recap to the month. And I, I published this or I, I generated the slide on Monday. September 25th. So this actually looks a little worse because as many of you know, the last few days have been red. But again, 2022 vibes, there's just not many places to hide. So this lime green is gold, intermediate term US treasuries in blue here. And these are ETFs that, that reflect these asset classes, foreign stocks, emerging markets, the S&P tech stocks, longer maturity bonds in a real estate index. So again, uh, things really started to break down around the middle of the month, and there hasn't been many places to hide. And bond yields have actually gone up, which is most apparent on the longer end of the yield curve. So longer maturity bonds are more sensitive to interest rates and bond yields going higher. As they go higher, you can see some of these dramatic uh, downward movements in longer maturity bonds. And in many cases, this TLT, which reflects 20-plus year U.S. treasuries, are down more than tech stocks over the last 19 months from peak to trough. This ETF, long-term treasury bonds, which is thought to be a safe asset class, is down about 60%. 60%, which again is an extreme outlier. I believe that's one of the worst stretches, if not the worst stretch for this particular ETF and asset class ever. Moving along year to date. So one thing that I wanted to point out here, so this is the basically the same set of asset classes. And again, I published this on Monday, September 25th, when the S&P was up 14% on a year-to-date basis. As of this recording on 9:27, so uh, Wednesday, just a few days later, this is more like 10.5%. It's been an ugly couple days. But what I really wanted to point out was the dispersion between U.S. large cap indexes. This is the S&P, again, starting in January 23 to uh, Monday, September 25th, up 14%. A lot of this stellar performance is driven by a handful of companies, which I've covered in the past, the big tech companies. If you strip out 
the seven largest tech companies, the seven best performers out of the S&P, you basically get the Dow, which again, I, I, I published this on Monday, Wednesday, the Dow is basically flat for the year. So once you remove the best performing stocks, the seven tech stocks that are driving almost 100% of the S&P's performance, you basically get the Dow, which is flat on the year. And nothing puts a bow on this further than when you look at the S&P performance at the sector level. So here are all the S&P sectors, and this is year to date, as of 925, I keep saying that, but as of 925, and just look how uneven this is. The range between the best performing sector in communication services minus, minus utilities is over 45%. That is unprecedented, and it just shows you how top-heavy some of the index returns have been for the S&P. So these three sectors, driven by Amazon, Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, and Meta, are driving most of the outperformance. Once you strip this out, markets are essentially flat for the year. So if you own these big stocks, congratulations. They've been a tailwind. Of course, last year you got crushed. But if, if you're trailing or if performance is not what you want it to be, look no further than a handful of stocks driving much of the S&P's performance. Let's talk about seasonal factors here. And much like post-World War II, how 2023 is, is closely following the averages, the seasonal trends have been almost spot on this year. So we got off to a really good start to start 2023, kind of hit a lull in the summer and the spring had a a rough stretch in August and September, and you can see over the last 100 years, last 50 years, and last 20 years, August and September are the worst performing months over all three of these time periods, okay? It's not true every year, but some years, and when you take the average, this this ends up proving true. There's some seasonal weakness in August and September. Now, the good news for investors is this completely flips in the fourth quarter. So again, over the last 20, 50, and 100 years, green, red, and blue, the fourth quarter historically shows seasonal strength. So if things go according to plan, it's gone according to plan from a seasonal standpoint, post-World War II averages versus 2023. If it continues these trends, the fourth quarter should be better. But again, you can't set your watch to this. Uh, past performance is not a promise of future returns. Now, given that it's been U.S. large cap and everything else over the last nine months, let's say, many investors are asking, well, why in the heck would I own small cap stocks or REITs or global equities or emerging markets? And that's a fair question. For the better part of a decade, for over a decade, it's been U.S. large cap stocks, U.S. tech stocks, and everything else. U.S. stocks have outperformed over the last decade plus, and it hasn't even been close. However, a big predictor of future equity returns is starting point. And many of these out-of-favor asset classes, the setup is much more favorable because they're not fully valued. They're trading cheaper, much cheaper relative to U.S. large cap stocks. So what this is, Vanguard publishes their 10-year annualized return projections for multiple equity asset classes. And I highlighted a few. So if you're a U.S. growth investor from here over the next 10 years, on an annualized basis, Vanguard is predicting about a 1% to 3% annualized return for U.S. large cap stocks as a whole. So think the S&P 500, let's say, between 3.7 and 5. 7% annualized each year for the next 10 years. When you look at some of these other equity asset classes, Vanguard's estimates, their future return estimates are much higher between four and 6% for small cap, four and 6% for REITs. Look at global equities, much higher expected uh, or projected returns for global equities. And a lot of that has to do with their out of favorness today, if that's a word, lower lower valuation relative to U.S. large cap stocks, which should be a precursor to future outperformance. However, U.S. large cap stocks, U.S. growth stocks could continue to outperform for the next one, two, or three years. So over the short term, anything can happen. Over the long term, if I was a betting person, I would say this 
would be a reasonable calculated risk to take in global equities and emerging markets and some of these out of favor equity asset classes. Let's look at a misery index for the US consumer. So what this is, this combines mortgage rates plus gas prices over the last 20 years. So this is the 30 year national average mortgage and your average gallon of gas. And this is starting to hit or already hitting the US consumer. And if this continues, there's gonna be a breaking point, okay? So this doesn't affect the person who's owned their house for 10 years and has a 3% mortgage or the person who works from home. But if you're a new home buyer, if you just sold your house and looking for another house, uh, if you're commuting back and forth to work again and you're back in the office, this is starting to pinch the US consumer, okay? And for a Fed that's concerned about oil prices and gas prices and home prices, and the cost of rent and the cost of shelter, this is a headwind for inflation. Now, there's multiple ways to calculate inflation. What I'm saying is this is going to start to hit the U.S. consumer. And this is not uncommon. When the Fed starts to raise rates, there's pockets of these imbalances where, as we'll see from corporate borrowing costs, the impact of higher rates hasn't really filtered through. But on the consumer, you can make an argument this has filtered through and credit card rates are at all time highs. Mortgage rates are at 20 plus year highs. Uh, so there's all of these things. The cost of an auto loan are at multi-year highs. So there's things that are that are tightening, that are restricting the consumer, that are starting to show up. And that's what the Fed wants. The risk is if you overdo it in conditions, get tight. And there's this lag effect between hiking and the impact on the real economy the Fed runs the risk of pushing a delicate um, landing, a delicate situation into a economic recession. So this is something that we're watching. And again, you can see from this chart, these are 20 year highs for the misery index of mortgage rates and gas prices. This is not what the Fed wants to see. All right, a lot of questions on interest rates, what the Fed does next. So this blue line is basically the Fed's path. Right from March 21, they started hiking in March 22. We're hiking, we're hiking. Now the Fed funds rate is around, I believe, 5.25%. The colored lines, the non blue lines, I should say, are what the market is predicting the Fed does next. So down here, we get into the fall, early 2024, and then into 2025. And basically, at the start of this month, the Fed futures market was predicting a more aggressive or more accommodative Fed, meaning the Fed cutting rates starting in early 2024. Now this line is kind of flattened out and you're getting this narrative of higher rates for longer. Okay, so that reflects this gap here. So now people are saying the Fed still might cut, but it might not start until late spring or summer. Now this is, this is data dependent, inflation dependent. You can't set your watch to this, but this futures market as we've talked about in the past, it's pretty sharp. It's smart people voting with their capital, uh, betting on what they think the Fed does next. So this is something to watch. If this line goes down a little bit, if the Fed starts to cut, if they pause, that could be an inflection point. The market likes certainty. They like to know what the Fed is going to do next. And right now, like I talked about, there's some, there's some disconnect between market expectations and what the Fed is actually saying. All right. Now, this is global policy rate, which is essentially what other global central banks are doing. And this is a unique time because emerging markets, Latin American central banks are actually cutting short-term interest rates. Usually the Fed is kind of the leader of global monetary policy, meaning the Fed's the first to hike, the Fed is the first to cut. That's not the case. And of course, inflation, as we've talked about, is not a centralized thing. What's true here is different in Canada, it's different in Mexico. So what's happening is inflation is starting to recede in many of these other countries, specifically emerging markets in Latin America, and these central banks are cutting. Now, it's, only, it's probably only a matter of time before developed countries, Europe, Canada, Australia, start to cut rates. Uh, but this is unique in that some of these emerging smaller economies are leading the next phase of the monetary policy cycle, which would be a pause and then a cut. Okay, let's talk inflation. And inflation, there's many ways to calculate it. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but the overall trend across the board is down. That's good. 
overall trend over here, housing is down. That's good. What the Fed is watching, what they're very closely watching, is this services, personal consumption expenditures, excluding housing and energy. So what does this line mean? Think business services, insurance costs, entertainment, transportation, healthcare expenses. That's what the Fed is watching. And this had a not so welcome reversal last month. You can see this line was trending down. It spiked up in August. And that's why the Fed has started to talk tough over the last month or two regarding their future plans with interest rates. So this is causing them to say, hey, maybe we have one more hike left or two more hikes left. And you're seeing the strength in the dollar and you're seeing bond yields tick up and it's wreaking havoc in financial markets. This little squiggly lineup has as much of the blame as anything. So this is something that we're watching closely. The Fed is watching closely. And unfortunately, you can see this. This is pretty noisy, pretty choppy from month to month. What you would want to see is a clear trend down. And up until last month, that's what we had. So this is all good. Oil causes some oil prices going up causes some stress, but everything else is headed in the right direction. This is something that we're closely watching, and hopefully this can normalize back to the Fed's preferred 2% target at the very least, get going in the right direction, which is down. Okay, so I talked about the lag effect with raising interest rates, how it shows up quickly in some areas like the consumer and more slowly in other areas like corporate borrowing costs. So what this is, is the effective corporate interest rate. So meaning what rate companies pay to borrow, all right? And think about what we just came off of, a, a long period coming out of the financial crisis where interest rates, bond yields were extremely low. A lot of corporations were very smart in that they borrowed money at longer maturities, right? When rates are at one, two, 3%, and you can borrow money for 10 years at 2%, that's a pretty good trade if you're a corporation. So although interest rates have gone up, Corporate America are, is not seeing stress from that because they've locked in debt at these historically low rates of the past decade, okay? Now, once their bonds come due and interest rates stay high, let's say, that's going to that's gonna be the true test because their cost of capital is going to go up. It could take a, you know, a struggling or a marginal business, and if you increase the cost of capital by 100% or 200%, that could stress corporate America, which should show up in earnings, which could show up in stock prices. So for, for, for now, this is a good thing. Coming off record low rates, companies lock that in. Higher cost of capital, higher cost of borrowing is not filtering through the bottom line. But if rates stay higher for longer, that's something to watch. Okay, lastly, getting a lot of questions about the government shutdown. And I think this state of political chaos and dysfunction could be thought of as our normal baseline. Like this is not a unique thing. I mean, just look at the last year. People were saying that it was the end of the dollar, that the um, BRIC countries, Russia, South Africa, China are going to create a new currency and the dollar is going to go away. Well, if you look, the dollar is stronger than ever. We heard that the debt ceiling was going to wreak havoc and the government was going to shut down and markets were going to tank. Well, they came to a deal. The markets were fine. Now it's the debt ceiling, or excuse me, now it's the government shutdown. Uh, so what we did is pull all of the government shutdown episodes since 1990. There's been six, six occurrences. The average duration of the shutdown is about 14 days. S&P index total returns two weeks prior to the shutdown. With the exception of late 2018 and early 19, it's been a non-event, but this certainly was ugly, minus 8%. S&P performance two weeks after the shutdown. You can see, again, there's been... Some instances when it was difficult, like early 2018. But again, these two numbers are a, a non-event. Three months after, with the exception of January of 2018, the market's been higher, 5% on average post-shutdown. So again, these are more charged up with politics and emotion and the media is throwing it in your face. I'm not saying things can't get squirrely beforehand, but know that there's other factors at play here. Uh, certainly what the Fed does what inflation does, what bond yields do, what the dollar does, much, much, much more important than what some bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. want to debate or talk about. So I hope you enjoyed this. I tried to hit on many of the themes that we're watching. Again, this is a difficult time, and I know 
Some people might be frustrated with their bond portfolios or their equity performance. It's just a, it, it is a difficult market. And last year it was, if you owned anything, it was probably down. There were a few places to hide last year. There were gold, cash, short-term treasuries, and oil stocks. And no one wanted to own oil stocks the last 15 years. Fast forward this year, bonds are a drag. Every other equity asset class is a drag. Once you strip out the seven best performing stocks in the S&P, U.S. large cap stocks are flat. So again, this is just unintended consequences coming out of the pandemic. You get these inflection points when the market is expecting one thing, a pause and potential cuts, and the Fed is saying another, like, wait, we're not done yet. We could hike once or even twice more. There's this dis disconnect between what the Fed's saying and market expectations. Anytime you get that, there's going to be noise. And as I wrote last week, bond investors, you have to be patient. One can argue bonds are more attractive than at any point over the last 10 years. Current starting yields, which are higher than any point over the last 10 years, are a great predictor of future bond performance. And right now, the U.S. 10-year yield is about 4.5%. And over the next 10 years, you should see aggregate bond returns track somewhere around that 4.5%. So the message is for folks that are retired, for folks that need to generate investment income off of their portfolio, the total, the total return equation looks better now than it ever has because fixed income finally has income. Back in 2016, you weren't getting anything off your bond portfolio. All of your returns had to come from the appreciation of the assets. Now, we can clip 3%, 4% off a investment grade bond portfolio. You, you know, you add some some you add some dividend income to that. Now, if we're you know targeting a, a 7% total return, let's say, I'm just throwing that out there, half might come from dividend income, bond interest income, the other half might come from appreciation. So it's a much more balanced equation than it was in this lower rate environment. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to send an email to insight at peerportfolios.com. We'll see you next month. Thank you.